want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, and uh, we'll just consolidate the word a bit here today. Matthew t- chapter 20, and there's, um, there's a phrase, in fact, let's just go ahead and read it. It's actually the last verse of chapter 19. I remind you that verses and chapters were not in the original text. They were added later so that we could find stuff. And uh, so the last verse of chapter 19 actually sets up the story that we're going to read in chapter 20. So the last verse in chapter 19 says, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. How many of you have heard that phrase before? Many who are first will be last, and the last first. And then jump all the way down to verse 16 of chapter 20. And it says, so the last will be first, and the first last. In between, sandwiched in between those two identical statements is a story. Now, I don't know, you know, your exposure to this statement. It may mean little, nothing to you, I don't know. Um, I've always thought that what this statement was saying is the first shall be last, the last shall be first. What it meant was, if you humble yourself, God will promote you. If you tend to be full of self-promotion, then God will put you at the, at the, at the bottom of the deck and uh, just to teach us stuff. And it's just not the point of the story at all. The point of the story is fascinating to me, and so let's have fun and read through this story. And uh, in fact, let me give you a little bit of a context. Um, one of the themes that we've repeated probably literally 100 times in the last 15 to 20 years is the fact that when people spend time with Jesus, people hang out with Jesus, they, desires get formed in us to achieve, to accomplish, for a certain destiny, purpose. Uh, these things begin to get stirred up in us. It's hard to imagine how disciples that were fishermen in the Sea of Galilee could ever one day wake up and decide to be world changers. I doubt that they had that desire when they had a life goal of just catching more fish. But something happened in their time with Jesus where they started embracing eternal purpose, destiny, significance, all that kind of stuff, the sense of identity. So being with Jesus actually stirs up passions and desires in us. And the Lord puts us in environments where desires and dreams just start bubbling up. They just start forming. We start, we start thinking things we never thought before. We start praying for things we never dreamt were even possible. All of that is because of our life in Christ. But what happens is the Lord puts us in an environment where dreams, desires, visions, all this stuff start to form in us. And sometimes they, can I say it this way? The root system is right. The manifestation is wrong. The root system, the desire to accomplish anything is right. But James and John wanting to call down fire to kill an entire city, that manifestation is wrong. All right? The God-given ability to dream and to think of impossible things was right. The way it manifested in them was wrong. God never rebuked them for their desires for greatness. He just redefined greatness. You can't prune a branch you can't see. And so Jesus puts us in an environment where things grow that can be pruned. It's the proof you're a son and daughter of God. God rewards all growth with pruning. He's saying, good job, clip. And that is our life. And so he's trying to form things in us that represent Jesus well, all right? So the dreams, the desires, passions, destinies, significance, all these things that are God birthed in us, they all will take on wrong manifestations if left alone. And that's why the word of God is so vital for us every day. And don't skip the hard stuff. Don't skip the stuff where he says you have to lose your life for my sake to find it. Don't skip that verse. Read it twice. <laughs> you you got to read it. Why? Because it's a sore. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's pruning shears. 
Jesus spoke to his disciples in John 15. He says, he says uh, you're the vine, uh, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, the Father prunes it. And then the very next verse, he says, but you are clean already. The word clean there is the word prune. You are pruned already because of the word I've spoken to you. So the whole point is, is let God talk to you because that's what keeps us pruned. And it's not punishment. When God puts you in an environment where you have all these dreams and visions and aspirations, and he goes, no, we need to redefine this one. He's not punishing you. He's just saving you from yourself. (laughs) Yes, he is. He's saving you from yourself. What the Lord does is he disciplines us so that his blessings won't kill us. That's the truth. All right. So we see in verse 30 of chapter 19, many who are first will be last and the last first. Now let's read the story. It's a number of verses, so make sure you've got your Bible and follow along. Verse 20, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. And again, about the sixth hour of the day and the ninth hour, he did likewise. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing idle all day? And they said, because no one hired us. So he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those who came, who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius, which is what he promised the first group. When the first came, they supposed they would receive more, and they likewise received a denarius. A denarius is an amount of money. When they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and yet you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours, go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil? Uh, Some translations say, is your eye envious because I am good? So the last will be first and the first will be last. God is merciful enough to us to break protocol and to hire, excuse me, to promote people that least deserve it before the people that worked hard for it. It's the painful truth. It's the painful truth. That we know that we come into the kingdom entirely by grace. It's just the way it works. We know that. We know that none of us could have earned this amazing salvation. But unfortunately, when you begin to serve the Lord for a while, you start thinking in terms of your faithfulness, your obedience, as actually earning a place of promotion or increase with God. And there is a measure of truth to that, that the Lord honors faithfulness. But the bottom line is, even when I'm rewarded for being faithful, It's entirely by grace. And the Lord wants to make sure I know that. So he'll take the person who's brand new in the Lord and release over them an anointing I've been crying out for for 30 years. And it's just not right. It's just not fair at all. And we see it happen constantly with our students who come in, you know, some of them get saved, you know, three months before they come to school and they're in school for six weeks and they're already seeing blind eyes open and seeing the lame walk. And I'm going, hey, Hey, some of us have been after this for a while. How about some increase here? And the Lord says, is your eye evil or is your eye envious because I am good? I personally think jealousy and envy is the number one blockage to promotion. Number one blockage to promotion. 
Because what the Lord does is what we have asked for requires that we be tested. Tested in the sense, tested not to be proven wrong, but tested to be, to see the quality of what we can carry. Because what we ask for in the Lord, the, the anointing we want to live with, the breakthroughs, the, the wisdom, the influence, the kinds of things we want to see. We want to see entire cities and nations change. And for that to be fulfilled, he has to find people that can carry the weightiness of presence, the weightiness of promise, the weightiness of his glory without buckling under, in other words, without taking the glory under themselves. And for that to be tested, what does he do? He says, the last will be first. You know who the last are? Those are the ones you think are not qualified. (laughs) And he makes them first. And the ones that you think have earned it to the max, you. He makes last. (laughs) And why does he do that? Because he has to make sure that we're capable of caring what he gives us, that we never forget the one simple thought. All of it is by grace. My greatest promotion, his well done, good and faithful servant, I'm going to receive that knowing even that was by grace. One of the things that Jesus taught in... uh, in Luke, it's in Proverbs, but it's also in Luke 16 where Jesus taught about money. And he said, if you don't know how to handle another person's possession, how will you be able to handle that which is your own? And it's fascinating to me that the Lord actually has a desire for you to have something that you can call your own. I know that we often think in terms of, well, he owns everything. And yeah, that's true, but he thinks differently than we do. The, we have religious mindsets, he has kingdom mindset. And his desire is actually for you to have that which is called your own. And so his process is, he says, you have to know how to handle another person's possession, which means what? Well, it may be the way you handle a rented car. Hey, hey, careful. (laughs) And it may be the person that you think is least qualified for blessing and promotion, they get the very promotion you've been praying for. By promotion, I don't mean just at work. It may include that. But I mean the breakthrough, the insights. They stand up and give the testimony how God provided them miraculously. You've been fasting for a year for breakthrough and, you know, God to provide the the, the million dollars that uh, I just read about uh, that he's going to give us in a minute. That uh, we've been praying for that breakthrough. And then somebody that's just new in the faith or somebody that just messed up their entire life, God just out of nowhere plucks them out and they, he just promotes them right in front of you. How do you handle another person's possession, which means what? How do you handle their moment of joy? It is now your possession because he said rejoice with those who rejoice, which means what? When he says rejoice with those who rejoice, he's commanding me to adjust my experience to the experience of others around me. Yeah, but mine's a a time of difficulty. Adjust because they're rejoicing. And if I can't rejoice at another person's victory, I'm not really qualified to have the measure of victory I want for myself. The Lord actually tests the waters with us on how we handle other people's promotions, breakthroughs, increase. He's not fair. (laughs) But he is right. He's not fair in the way, let me put it this way. You know that justice thing that's on all of us? Toss it out, because he thinks different. (laughs) His concept of justice says the guy that started work at the 11th hour of the day only worked an hour, he gets the same wages as the guy who's worked 12 hours. That's justice to him. Justice to him is to take from the person who didn't handle the amount of money they had well, and he takes it away from them and gives it to the person who has the most. That's justice to him. He is just, but it's completely different than your justice and mine. And he's not changing. (laughs) This example I've given you for years is the old man petting a cat from the tail towards the head. Person says, you're petting the cat wrong. He said, then let the cat turn around. (laughs) Somebody's gotta move and it's not gonna be him. 
So kingdom thinks differently than you and I do for, for the most part. And so what it looks like is, it, here's, here's the problem, is oftentimes we have suspicions of how people got promoted. You know, suspicions, uh, that gift of discernment. You understand what I'm talking about? That gift of discernment that God's given you where you know everybody's business and why they did this and why they did that. Yeah, that one. As long as you call something that's wrong, you give it a virtuous name, you're insulating it from God's dealings. And when the Lord exposes that it's the envy of the heart that misinterprets God's goodness for what it is, and it actually causes me to interpret it to bring judgment or accusation or criticism against another person. It's kind of a perversion, isn't it, to take God's goodness, take that, and use it as a gift to accuse someone. And yet that's what he's saying. Discernment is often the title given to hide suspicion, and farther down that food chain is jealousy and envy. And jealousy and envy will keep you from, the, from what you've asked for in God. It'll actually block your progress into the very realms in God that you've asked for. And the best way to deal with jealousy and envy is to acknowledge what it is. To acknowledge what it is. To be honest and upfront. Because as long as you protect it, it's like, it's like harboring you know, a poisonous snake and trying to protect it. Call it for what it is. Cut the head off. When the Lord brought you in a situation where that branch grows, so to speak, or that thing manifests, the jealousy, the, the anger, the envy, the whatever it might be, when that thing starts to manifest, that's in his mercy. He's letting you see it so it can be dealt with. Because whatever you confess and forsake, he takes care of. But whatever you protect, you'll have to manage. Right? You can't discipline the flesh under righteousness. I, I've been running an experiment for the last couple of months. I, I'm a little bit embarrassed. I, I, I can't say that I learned this 20 years ago. It's only been the last maybe three months at the most. I, I do pretty good at not, um, not coming up with accusations towards people, other ministries and stuff. We have the privilege of, of joining with so many different ministries around the world. Goodness, I was just with a whole bunch of different streams the last three weeks. I mean, 18 days I was gone. I love it so much because I really do value uh, the whole body of Christ. And anyone I've ever got to work with through the years, I've, I've left with such an appreciation for who they are. I learned it from my dad, actually. My dad, when he was the pastor here way back in the 70s, I remember he would have, uh, he, I remember one Sunday, he had a Catholic priest preach one Sunday morning and a Baptist evangelist the next. I mean, that's diversity right there. So I was raised celebrating diversity. So I don't, have, I don't have an issue there. That's not one of my issues. But every once in a while, I'll thumb through, you know, Charisma Magazine or something, and I see somebody I don't know, but I know of. And I look at it, and I have that little gift of suspicion going on. Yeah, I'm sorry to admit it. I don't let it develop into accusation. I, I know enough to not go there, but I, I look at it and go, yeah, turn the page. I, I started something about three months ago. I would get to that point where that thing would dial up and I, I would stop and I'd look at the person's picture or the name of the ministry and silence the suspicious thoughts. Silence. Until my heart, I could feel the pleasure of the Lord for that person. Yeah. And And... And it was, it was, it was a miracle. <laughs> it was a miracle. There was, there was no, there was no loud voices in my head. All there was, was absolute appreciation for their contribution to what God is doing in the earth. And it would happen in literally in moments. It would happen in moments. I'd look at it and go, oh, 
how dumb. I actually, I actually had suspicious thoughts when, when in reality, here's someone God has promoted. He's taken that which was last, he made them first, and has given me an opportunity to celebrate their victory because now their victory is mine. It's, there's, a, there's another strange part to the story. Let me just read it to you real quickly. He said, where there's envy and self-seeking, there's confusion in every evil thing. The context out of James chapter 3 is actually a description of the demonic that invades where there's selfish ambition and envy. So by going into envy, what happens is we actually open up a door with invitation for the demonic to come and to bring confusion. Helping us to see that jealousy is really discernment. That's being sarcastic. If you didn't, if you didn't get it. If you didn't get it, let me help you walk, walk you through my sense of humor. That's what the demonic does, is it parades what you think and feel as being authentically from God. It's your gift to pick up and to discern. When in fact, what the enemy's trying to do, he's looking for more of your heart to influence with his venom, with his, his control. Jealousy and envy has to stop. And it stops in the moment we learn to celebrate somebody else's victory, especially when their victory is the one we need. Because what I've noticed is the Lord, will, like, like a prophet will stand up here, Chris or whoever will stand up here and bring this tremendous prophecy, a promise of God for this church family. And we're all going, yeah. And we take that word, but he doesn't, the Lord doesn't release that blessing to everybody at the same time. Yeah. We go, yeah. And then the only one who seems to get it the next week is the guy who just got saved last week. And that's just not right. <laughs> and we're going, well, that can't be authentic. That's got to be one of them counterfeit miracles. <laughs> See, if you can put a spiritual title on whatever you're suspicious of, then you've protected your own, you know. Oh. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's in you. He delights in people. Quiet the suspicious thoughts. Look someone in the eye. What I I actually will will do often, and forgive me if this is abstract and awkward to you, but for me, this is how it works. If If I put my hand on somebody's shoulder, I usually will feel the pleasure of the Lord for them. That's probably why I'm so touchy. Or the or the sort at the the school of ministry when we when we knight our first year st- students I I I do I put my, the sword on their shoulder I keep it there just for a couple seconds I can feel that pleasure of the Lord for that person so what happens then is I start interpreting a person's nature and gifts by how he sees them. Yeah. Now I can't tell you I do that all the time but I we're working on it we're I'm a work in progress. There's progress. The finish line hasn't come yet, which I'm thankful for. I don't plan on dying anytime real soon. But uh, you get the point. The point is, is that jealousy, selfish ambition, self-promotion, these kinds of things are killers in an atmosphere where you're given permission to dream. Where you're given permission. What happened to the disciples? Jesus comes along, he says, whatever you ask for, I'm going to do for you. Abide in me. My words abide in you. Ask whatever you want. Ask the Father in my name. And whatever you ask him in my name, I'm going to do for you. And he gives all these promises. And the disciples, they they start saying, well, there's a city over here that wouldn't let us even walk through town. And we'd like, with your permission, to call down fire on them and kill them all. (laughs) I mean, you know, that fits into the category, whatever you ask. Jesus always reserves the right to say no to whatever undermines your purpose. The disciples are empowered to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. They come back thinking they're more significant and more important than the other one. What does Jesus do? He says, good, that's a branch I can see. That one's got to be pruned. 
And they say, well, this group, we're better than that group. They, they tried to cast out demons. We told them not to. Even though they were doing it your name, we knew it just wasn't right because they're not with us. So in other words, we know we're not better than each other, but certainly as a group, we're better than them. <laughs> and Jesus says, yep, that branch grew right where I can see it. Let's prune that one back. And, and that's what he does. He puts us in, he doesn't kill the plant. He prunes the illegal expression of kingdom ideas. Right? Because there's not a person in this room that won't have a wrong expression of a good idea that God gave you. That's why we need the constant exposure to the voice of God, the written word of God, where he speaks to our hearts and he says, I'm forming this in you, but I'm not forming this in you. And so we're going to prune this back. We're going to cut this back. Why? Because jealousy will keep you from what he's called you to. And just to make sure we get it, he promotes people around us that we know too well. (laughs) And perhaps God hasn't talked to us about why they don't deserve that promotion. I'm joking with you. I think we've all struggled with it, but we've all succeeded as well. None of us got here because of our works. And I love how the Lord is taking people who just came into the things of the kingdom and things that honestly I I spent 20, 30 years pursuing, crying out for, and they get it in weeks. It's just like the Lord, and it is beautiful. What is it that you're asking God for? What is the breakthrough that you need? What is it the the insight, the gifting, the opportunity, the favor, the open doors, the whatever it might be. All the things that we need to succeed at what God's called us to do. If you can keep your eyes open for anyone that is experiencing what you've longed for and champion them. I mean really, from the heart, champion them. It will qualify you for your own victory. It's an important part of the, the kingdom. Why? Because we're members of a body. None of us are in this by ourselves. As uh, David Duplessis would say years ago, he says, God has no grandchildren. Nobody got in because of somebody else. Everyone has a personal relationship. That's the only way it works. We're members of that body. And when one part suffers, we all suffer. How many of you have had an, an injury in your body and your whole body ached, even though it was unrelated? Yeah. It's just the way it is. But when one part succeeds and is blessed, the entire part succeeds. So another person's victory is your victory. And the moment we partner with people's breakthroughs and celebrations and victories, you know, somebody else gets, you know, the car that you prayed for, somebody else gets the job that you prayed for. You know, to actually celebrate and rejoice and congratulate and, and as though it were your own is the biggest threat to jealousy taking any kind of root in us. God in his mercy will treat the people around you any way necessary to expose a bent towards jealousy or envy in you. And it's not punishment, it's his kindness. It's his kindness because what he plans to build in you is very, very significant. Why don't you stand? We'll wrap this up. Pray together. Take a look at me with uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, excuse me, chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to read five verses. Verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Um, Look at this again. Verses 1 and 2 gives us warning. I don't know how your Bible reading goes. I just want to encourage you, don't skip over the hard stuff. It's it's so vital. Here's the difference. There's meat and milk of the word. 
Are you with me on that analogy? There's meat of the word, there's the milk. Milk comforts, meat provokes change. Meat is called in Hebrews the word of righteousness. So it is the word that equips, enables, and provokes. It cuts to bring about change. And we all want to be comforted, but we've also be, got to be changed through the reading of word, the embracing of what God has said. And sometimes it's just, it's meditating on receiving, dwelling, slowing down in the hard places. He who gains his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will gain it. Slow down in those passages because it needs to cut deep. It's got to cut deep. If it doesn't cut if it, if it doesn't bring pain, it's not, a, it's not the word of righteousness that brings change. There's got to be that, that point where you go, oh, it's necessary. It, it's, let me illustrate it this way. There are people who have certain kinds of uh, afflictions, difficulties in their body, and perhaps you go to a doctor and the doctor says, uh, man, you have no feeling in your foot. He says, no. So he takes a sock and shoe off and he takes a needle and he'll just prick the bottom of the foot and there's no pain. See, it's not a good sign to not feel pain. It's not positive. It's actually, it's a sign of a problem is when, is when something should hurt and it doesn't. You don't ever want to read through this stuff and go, oh yeah, all is well. Not a good sign. <laughs> not a good sign. You want that thing to prick. You want to go, oh, that hurts so good. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, it's, that, it's that word that makes you know you're alive. So he talks about those who fall away from the faith. Interestingly, verse 3 says, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to receive with thanks, uh, thanksgiving. Let, let me just stop there. This is kind of a, a, a weird deal. Paul's warning uh, Timothy and, and the group that he leads. He's warning them. He said, listen, um, we know people's hearts are going to grow cold. They're going to become deceived by demons. This, all this junk's going to happen. And out of that group is going to come a list of rules, non-biblical rules. Now remember, the Bible does give us commands, and don't ignore them just because you live under grace. Grace doesn't give you a pass to skip the rules. Grace gives you the power to do the rules. So here's a list of rules that's created out of this deceptive movement. And what is it? They are rules that make you more pleasing to God. That's what they say. So in other words, you're going to obtain favor. If you do this, if you don't marry, you don't eat these certain foods, you do this, this, and this. You observe this particular day in Romans, he, he expands the list. He says you, you follow this day instead of this day, you eat this instead of this, you drink this instead of this. These list of rules, if you do everything just right, then you'll have favor with God. What happened to Adam and Eve? The serpent crawled up to him and said, if you partake of this fruit, you'll be like God. They already were. Yeah. The enemy tried to get them to obtain through works what they already had by grace. One of the most significant truths to really be embraced and taught on in the last 20 plus years has been the whole concept of impartation. It's, it's just such a rich truth because there can be a grace, an anointing, a gifting on one person's life and they can pray for someone else and they actually start functioning in that area. But what's kind of humorous to me, I, you, just forgive me for my sense of humor again, but what's kind of humorous to me is oftentimes people will come and ask for prayer for something that is actually a mark of maturity. You can't get through maturity through impartation. If only that were true, man, we could just line up and be like Paul tomorrow, you know. Yeah. Maturity comes from choices, making yeah. decisions. So you can pray for someone. You can be one minute old in Jesus and pray for somebody who has cancer, and they can be healed. It didn't come, the gifting didn't come from maturity. Uh, th excuse me, the gifting, yeah, it didn't come from years in Christ. It just came from grace. The maturity comes when you are now faced with decisions. What are you going to do? with the fact somebody just got healed through you. Do you think it's your significance? Do you think you are the source of the gift? Do you think you are the source of the faith? How is the story shared? Is it shared with you at the center or Jesus? And all, all we do in those moments is we're, we're allow, the Lord is actually measuring what realm or measure of glory can we live with, can we carry? 
See, the original target of the Lord for every person was to actually live in the glory of God. And just for simplicity's sake, we'll define the glory as the manifested presence of Jesus. It's the actualized presence of God. And so the scripture says, all have fallen short of the glory of God. So sin means to miss the mark. So sin causes people to miss God's intended target. What was the intended target? The glory of God. To live in the manifested presence of Christ. Not just as a point of theology, not just as a point of doctrine, I am in Christ, he is in me. But more than that, an actualized, realized reality that we live from. Where we see the God of Scripture appear in unusual ways and rest upon people in unusual ways and manifestations in the temple or tabernacle. That is actually the manifestation that, that is potentially a part of everybody in this life who has a personal relationship with Jesus. So all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. Missed the mark. What does salvation do? It restores us to the target. It doesn't restore us halfway to the target so that in heaven we can get the rest. When Jesus said it was enough, he actually meant, I did everything needed to accomplish the original plan. And so Jesus intends to live, is, it lives among us, lives in us, rests upon us. But there are measures of presence that are yet to be discovered that have been discovered in prior generations. 